There's something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear That the only thing we have to fear is fear itself Ask not what your country can do for you Ask what you can do for your country I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. George Bernard Shaw once wrote, some people see things as they are and say, why? I dream things who never were and say, why not? There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. The Patriotic Progressive. For truth, justice, and the democratic way. And now your host, Stephen Hanks. During the summer of 2020, when the coronavirus pandemic was getting out of control, especially in New York, where I was living at the time, we were on lockdown, and with a lot of free time in my hands, I began writing essays on the platform Medium. One of those essays was titled, Disillusionment and the Demise of American Exceptionalism. And at that point, before another eroding of American exceptionalism on January 6, 2021, there was plenty for this patriotic progressive to be disillusioned about, especially since the election of Donald Trump. There was disillusionment in knowing that 63 million Americans had voted for a racist and misogynist in the 2016 election. There was disillusionment in knowing that an American president had help in being elected by and was being manipulated by the authoritarian leader of Russia. There was disillusionment in knowing that an American president and his family were using the presidency to grow their personal piggy bank. There was disillusionment in knowing that the president was using the Department of Justice to do his personal bidding. There was disillusionment about the millions of Americans who during a pandemic were fighting mask mandates, compelling me at the time to write that, quote, our country is populated with millions of stupid, stubborn, selfish, self-centered, and ultimately self-destructive semi-humans who seem totally ignorant about what rights and freedom truly mean in a democracy. And that was before the vaccine deniers and the election deniers reared their ugly heads. But when I wrote that essay four years ago, there was one aspect of American culture I wasn't quite disillusioned about, but I am now. And in a profoundly sad way, because my career was as a magazine journalist and editor. And that disillusionment is over the current state of the American mainstream media and what were once some of our gloried press institutions, specifically the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. While the New York Times ultimately came around to endorsing Kamala Harris for president, the paper not only spent the previous eight years normalizing Donald Trump, they went out of their way to demean Joe Biden at every turn because he wouldn't give them interviews, play their, quote, we treat both sides the same, unquote, objectivity game, and hold Kamala Harris to a higher standard than they ever held Donald Trump. But as disappointing as that may be, what's even worse is the stories that broke the past few days regarding both the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post deciding they were not going to endorse a candidate for president in this election. And in both cases, the editorial boards of these once esteemed newspapers were prepared to publish endorsements of Kamala Harris 
but the oligarch owner slash publishers quashed those endorsements. In the case of The Post, owned by Jeff Bezos, the speculation is that Bezos is hedging his bets in case Trump is elected because he doesn't want retribution against both The Post and Amazon. Well, folks, the retribution against those decisions are happening as editors at those papers are resigning and tens of thousands of readers are canceling subscriptions. I canceled mine months ago. These decisions not to endorse Harris for president came mere days after reports published in those very papers that Donald Trump's former chief of staff called him a fascist who admired Adolf Hitler, which at any previous time in our history would have been disqualifying. And these decisions not to endorse Kamala Harris for president is after nine, eight or nine years of Donald Trump calling the news media, quote, the enemy of the people, unquote, and his most recent statements about seeking to destroy, quote, the enemy within, unquote, in America, which means, among other things, that Donald Trump would end freedom of the press in this country. Disheartening, demoralizing, disillusioning. And on that cheerful note, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you out there in Sedona and throughout the Verde Valley listening right now on this October 26th, 2024 through KAZM 106.5 FM and 780 AM Mellow Mountain Radio. Like the announcer said, my name is Stephen Hanks and this show, which is heard every Saturday morning at 8 AM, is called The Patriotic Progressive for Truth, Justice and the Democratic Way. And I also want to welcome folks from all over Arizona and around the country who may be tuning into the live stream on MellowMountainRadio.com and anyone who is listening to the podcast version on Apple or Amazon Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and now you can also listen to the podcast on my Substack newsletter at Patriotic Progressive. Now, I have two very special guests in the KAZM studio with me this morning. Ellen Ferreira, who is the president of the Democrats in the, of the Red Rocks in Sedona, and Stephen Williamson, who I'm sure many KAZM listeners know as the host of the Democrat, pra, de, excuse me, Democratic Perspective show that's broadcast Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. Before I chat with Ellen and Stephen and get their takes on where we stand at this point in the election cycle, I want to acknowledge this week's sponsor of the Patriotic Progressive it's Aubrey Sonderegger, Democratic candidate for Coconino County Recorder. Now, folks, the recorder is an extremely important position in this area of Arizona as the recorder oversees how elections are run in the county, part of which includes Sedona. Aubrey grew up in the Southwest and has been a resident of Flagstaff since 2011. She is a committed mom and outdoor enthusiast whose political activism began in 2016. Aubrey has worked to defend voting rights and elect people into government that will uphold the ideals of democracy and civil rights for every citizen. Aubrey has held various elected positions in the Coconino County Democratic Party, through which she promoted civic engagement from the very diverse demographics of Coconino County. So if you want to continue the legacy of free and fair election services in Coconino County, you must vote for Aubrey Sonderegger for Recorder. Speaking of the upcoming elections, please remember that this Tuesday, October 29th, is the deadline to mail back your early ballot. And when you fill out that ballot or vote on election day, please make sure you not only vote for Aubrey Sonderegger, but for Democrats up and down the ticket, no matter which county of Arizona you're in, as part of my listening audience. And as I mentioned on last week's show, there are 13 statewide propositions on the ballot this election. And of course, the big one is Proposition 139, which would establish a state constitutional right to abortion. You must vote yes for reproductive freedom for women, 
For more information on all the ballot propositions, both statewide and in Yavapai and Coconino County, please go to my favorite political website, www.democratsoftheredrocks.org. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to have to hold off on my chat with Ellen and Stephen because we are waiting for a call in from one of the most high profile Arizona candidates in the upcoming election. And that's Jonathan Nez, the former president of the Navajo Nation and now the Democratic candidate for Congress for CD2 against Republican and Trump enabling sycophant Eli Crane. Jonathan was an in-studio guest a few weeks back, and I wanted my listeners to hear from him again today because there has been some excellent news regarding his campaign. Jonathan is going to be here any minute. We're waiting for him to call. But in the meantime, I'm going to talk to the president of the Democrats of the Red Rocks, Ellen Ferrara. He's on? Okay. So as I was saying... (laughs) Um, Jonathan Nez is called in. This is amazing. I mean, we're on the show, and I got a call in from the Democratic candidate for Congress. Uh, Jonathan, are you on the line? Uh, I'm here, Steve, and good morning uh, to you, Ellen, and all the listeners. Uh, I really appreciate you calling in. I I know you you were on the show uh, a few weeks ago, and I really appreciated that. It was great having you here, but... I, I'm, I wanted to have you here again today. R- really important because, as I just mentioned to my listeners, there's been some excellent news coming out regarding your campaign. And some of it has actually made some of the press. I, I saw one story, um, I think it was a Payson publication, talking about how the, ra- the, the polling is 42-42 between you and Eli Crane with which means there were 16% undecided. And I don't know, as I think I'm somewhat politically savvy, so I would think that that 16% undecided is a very, very good sign when it comes to polling for an incumbent uh, congressman. So give us an update on the campaign and how you're reading the polling and where you are right now. Well, Steve, our, our, our message is resonating uh, throughout the district. You know, it, it's it's not about party. It's a, it's about our country. It's about, you know, uh, focusing on the needs of the district. And, you know, I have been going through uh, the district in many communities uh, from uh, Prescott, Prescott Valley, uh, all the way to city of Maricopa, up into the tribal communities. And... There's uh, similarities in what uh, folks uh, want Congress to address. You know, of course, the the rise uh, cost of goods and services, gas prices. You know, Congress has a a, a large influence on on that and, and lessening uh, those uh, the prices uh, in the supermarket because we Congress can hold uh, corporations accountable. I mean, these, these corporations are having record-breaking profits, but mm-hmm. we as consumers still see, uh, you know, these prices and it's hurting our pocketbooks. And, you know, the, that type of message, of course, infrastructure as well, you know, the need for water, getting our fair share of water from the Colorado River, the tributaries, and preserving our precious groundwater. That That's what I've been hearing as I've been traveling throughout the the district, and you know that's what uh, got us uh, to be even with my opponent. Uh, it is a tie race, uh, and they and and what I've been hearing also from the voters is that we finally have a candidate or a person that lives in the district that that knows the district, other than you know my opponent not living in this district, living in Tucson and Oro Valley, and it's about time we. Uh, take the seat back for for our district with someone that knows the issues that are important to to the district voters. Uh, absolutely. Um, let me ask you: How much do you think being the former president of the Navajo Nation and being a Native American in this particular district and this particular race has impacted 
what the, what the polling looks like right now. I mean, is it, you know, I remember uh, talking to Congressman Gallego over a year ago before you got into the race and asking him, you know, what, how could we defeat Eli Crane? And his response to me was, well, our best shot is having a Native American candidate running in this race. How much of an impact do you feel that's had on where the race stands right now? Well, I, I know uh, that this district, the voting age population, twenty over 22% are Native American. And, you know, there there is a historic element to our run for office, you know, vying to be the first Native American uh, indigenous person to be elected from the state of Arizona to the U.S. House of Representatives. And I have seen rural and tribal communities and districts district excited uh, about this race. And, and, and they're excited because they, ha- they know that an individual, you know, me, Jonathan Nez, with my over 18 years of public service experience, has uh, delivered for the constituency. And I, I fought hard for the Navajo people. Obviously, they were my constituents. They were my voters. But I will bring that same fight for our fair share of resources to a larger scale here in Congressional District 2. That, that's, uh, that would be excellent. Let me, you may not be able to answer this because it's always a, a tricky question for uh, candidates, especially on the Democratic side. Now that the race looks as tight as it does, has there been any change in the input from uh, the DCCC in helping you either with resources or boots on the ground or just what do you what kind of feedback are you getting from the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee about your race right now? Well, I, I know that at, at the onset, you know, a lot of uh, organizations and political pundits uh, didn't think we would be this competitive, you know, at this point in time. Um, but I know that there are a lot of organizations, including the Democrat, the Democratic organization, the DCCC, that have seen that shift and are excited about the race, you know. And we're not, we're not on the radar, um, being from a red to blue. But I appreciate the grassroots movement. When I say grassroots, that's like rural and, and, and tribal members giving. Um, you know, a dollar to five to ten to twenty dollars to our campaign, and these are grassroots um, folks that that believe in this uh, this election and believe that uh, we could be able to have a common sense representative and not be swayed by the far right or the far left, but to stick to the issues that are important to them. Yeah, what do you have? You heard uh, Eli Crane make any statements at all in the last few days? regarding all this uh, news that's come out about General John Kelly's comments about Trump being a fascist? Has he, has he gone public defending Trump? Has he said anything at all um, about this situation in the last few days? Uh, not, not that I've, I'm aware of, Steve. You know, I mean, uh, much of my opponent's uh, comments are more at the national scale uh, those comments are done in, in Washington, D.C. or other places uh, that, um, you know, uh, other other listeners other than Congressional District 2 are hearing. And we, we want to hear from our congressman. You know, there was an opportunity twice to debate me. I was going to ask you about he, that, yeah. Right. And he, and he at the Arizona PBS, uh, he didn't show. Uh, and the second debate was the clean elections debate. He declined to, to debate me, and it just shows that he uh, doesn't have much to report to his voters, and, uh, you know, we wanted to have a, a civil discourse on the future of this country without any uh, division or e- either uh, uh, separation between, uh, you know, the, the voters out there. It is, I think that the voters see that it is time for us uh, to come back together where Democrats, independents, and Republicans work together uh, for what is important uh, to us. And that's, uh, you know, getting our fair share of water. That's infrastructure. 
uh, affordable housing, affordable child care, uh, also uh, affordable health care, and, you know, just making sure that uh, our, our people have um, uh, um, support, uh, not, not a handout, but a hand up for some folks that are having a difficult time uh, in, in this country or in the state. And, you know, I, I've had uh, 18 plus years of of a record of getting things done and bringing our fair share share resources to the constituency. Yeah, so I was I was going to ask you, you know, with 10 days left until election day, everybody's uh talking about what various candidates closing arguments are and I think we just heard your closing argument to a large extent. <laughs> <laughs> um so what what are you going to be doing for the next 10 days? First of all, I've got, as, as you know, I've got Ellen Ferreira, the president of Democrats of the Red Rocks on the show today, along with Stephen Williamson, who uh, hosts the uh, Democratic Perspective radio show on KAZM, both very extremely active in Democratic politics, and I know are big supporters of yours, as am I. We're all pulling for you uh, beyond what words could express. So um, what, do you, what do you have going on? Before I let you go, and I know you're really busy today, what do you have happening between now and Election Day? Uh, well, Steve, uh, I, I want to say, first of all, uh, the, the folks there, Ellen, uh, the organizations that have been coming out all across the state, to, to help us boost our profile, get the word out. You know, this district is one of the largest in the country. It's, it's larger than the state of Pennsylvania. And so I cannot knock on every single door before, uh, throughout the entire election, but it's great to get the message out through radio, the television ad, and the boots on the ground. And Ellen and her team and her team of volunteers has helped uh, get the message out for us, and I applaud uh, the Democrats in, in Sedona, and everyone. Uh, I, I've been calling folks all around the district. They, they would tell me, oh, someone came by and gave your literature to us, and we got to know you a little bit more. And, and this is a, a, a big outreach that's happening, not just for my candidacy, but uh, for a lot other candidacies uh, in this election, and I appreciate that. And as we close, you know, today I am in... Uh, Payson. Uh, we're going to have a uh, meet and greet here uh, with Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and then we're going to be up in Window Rock for, you know, of course, being the former president of the Navajo Nation, I had a, an invitation to uh, be a part of the event there, uh, welcoming uh, Governor Tim Waltz to the Navajo Nation and just encourage our people to come out and vote because. You know, uh, voting is is a sacred duty for for all of us. Well, uh, that's great. I know you're going to be really busy uh, ramping up the next 10 days. And I just want to leave you with this, Jonathan. Last night was probably as as a baseball fan. I'm going to relay this to you. Last night might have been one of the most exciting World Series games uh, in history (laughs) uh, with that grand slam to win the game for the Dodgers. All I can say is that if you pull off this victory, it is going to be way more exciting than Freddie Freeman hitting a grand slam in the World Series. So I know you're going to hit a grand slam in this election, and we're all pulling for you. Well, thank you, Steve, and and thank you, Ellen, and thanks to all our listeners out there. I know many of you have voted early already. Um, Please help each other out, get to the polls, and Let's uh, finish these uh, 10 days strong. That's great. Go- democracy. Mm-hmm. Best of Our luck. And, and we're going to be saying, uh, we're going to be calling you Congressman Nez come January. So go get them. Keep up the good work. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye Thanks. Now. Thanks for calling in. Wow, that was a big surprise. Ooh. Wink, wink. <laughs> Um, that was, ladies and gentlemen, that was Jonathan Nez, the Democratic candidate for Congress for Arizona, Congressional District 2. And if you haven't voted yet, you've got to vote for Jonathan Nez. We must. I'm, I'm emphasizing must. 
make Eli Crane a one-term congressman. So my other special guest this morning, yeah, just, Ellen, you want to chime in? Let me just add one more thing. Before I even introduce you, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, for over a year, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and the Arizona Democratic Party have been touting two seats, two congressional seats that they thought were flippable this year. Congressional District 1, Juan Siscomani, and Congressional District 6, uh, Schw- uh, David Schweib- right, Schweiger. Right. Um, no mention of CD2. Hmm. Now, all of a sudden, that two polls have come out showing that Jonathan Nez is neck and neck with Eli Crane. All of a sudden, people are paying attention. What the con- what uh, President Nez did not mention is that next Wednesday, the 30th, there is a reception in Phoenix with uh, Nancy Pelosi. Oh, right. I heard about And it that. was going to be for... CD1 CD and, and CD6. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, Jonathan Nez, CD2, wow. is on the agenda and will be part of that fundraiser. So that is an indication that he is getting national recognition all of a sudden. Yeah. So people say, don't believe the polls, don't look at the polls, but people are looking at that poll. And I think it's going to change and energize that campaign. Yeah. And like I said to, to, uh, to Jonathan, I think the 16% undecided is is it even a more interesting number than the 4242? Because th- that's a lot of people to be undecided when there's an incumbent in what's supposed to be a red district. I'm just throwing that out there. So anyway, as I started to say before Ellen appropriately interrupted, <laughs> my other guests are Ellen and Stephen Williamson. Ellen is the proud president of the Democrats of the Red Rocks in Sedona. She's a state committee person with the Arizona Democratic Party and was a DNC delegate representing AZCD2 at the national convention. I was so jealous. Um, In 2017 in Sedona, she founded After the March Indivisible as well as Sedona Action Network, leaders of community political organizations, and remains on the leadership teams of both groups. Stephen Williamson is in the studio, and he and his wife, Jessica, moved to Sedona from New York City, my hometown, in 2003, and almost immediately became involved in democratic politics in what he was told, as he wrote, quote, was Republican town, but there were a lot of Democrats. About a dozen exactly years ago. Exactly what I was told. <laughs> and um, the Kerry campaign uh, in 2004, Yes, it was, um, carried Sedona. And no one knew that this was a Democratic voting town. And one of the Buddhist monks checked this, the stats and found out that Kerry had actually carried Sedona by a pr- pretty good margin. So Dick Searle and I started, uh, the late Dick Searle, uh, uh, the great uh, kind of um, tech guy for, for Democrats of the Red Rock, um, we started looking into it, and we found that um, I guess there had been, I guess Gore had had lost Sedona, but there hadn't been another Democratic uh, candidate losing since then. And the only person who carried uh, uh, Sedona was John McCain. Mm-hmm. So Sedona was actually a, a Democratic town. Now, trying to get the Red Rock News to publish the fact that it was a Democratic voting town turned out to be a long ordeal. So what we did was try to get a campaign going to just explain what the actual facts were. And the facts were that that Sedona voted Democratic. Mm -hmm. And that was a big shock, I think, to everybody. And it's certainly something that the Red Rock News did not want to hear. Right. And... uh, So we began a campaign, letter writing, and denouncing them for not publishing our letters and so forth and so on. And um, we finally got them, I think, one little letter they stuffed up somewhere. But but that was the thing. That was the thing that that, here you had a town, Stephen, that that didn't even know how it was voting. There had never been any information about how it was voting. And in fact, if this monk hadn't checked on it, it might have been another four years before we found yeah. out. Yeah. So about a dozen years ago, while Stephen was leader in the Democrats of the Red Rocks, 
which Ellen is now president of, Stephen began hosting a 15-minute weekly radio program on KAZM called Democratic Perspective, and that eventually became a one-hour show that is still on the air now on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. So uh, let me formally welcome you both to the Patriotic Progressive this Thank morning. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I don't mind going on a competitor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think the I think the the competitor was the was the Republican who had a show, who fa- thankfully is no longer on the, the air here. The quality of the, uh, the of the Republican Party and their candidates in Northern Arizona is astonishingly I bad. Know, know. It's always been bad, yeah. Stephen. I know you have only been here a few years, but. My gosh! Yeah. I mean, they uh, uh, one t- terrible, terrible candidate after, after another. another. Yeah. And watching them in the in the early days, watching these these absolutely ghastly Republicans, and I I say that they're you know John McCain, you could argue for him, but the rest of them were pretty bad. Um, so one of the things that we we did was we formed Democratic Perspective. We were very worried, I was very worried that we weren't reaching out to anybody beyond committed Democrats. Mm -hmm. The Democrats at Red Rock, we were all talking to each other. Uh, In those days, for about 10, 12 years, I um, was the vice president of uh, DOR, and uh, my job was to really um, bring in speakers. And so we, we brought in speakers, and I think, as, as I said in my little note to you, um, if you had listened to the speakers for a couple of years, you got really a kind of a, a, a additional um, political education from, from just going to the door lectures. But that was the, that was the campaign in the right. early days, was just to get things going. And so... You know, nothing much has changed. We got Eli Crane. I mean, you, it's hard to thanks find to a worse the, congressman. Thanks than, to the redistricting that happened yeah. in 2020. So, yeah. Ellen, let me let me ask you as president of the Democrats of the Red Rocks. Um, you know, I mentioned to uh, Jonathan Nez about my little conversation with Ruben Gallego when there was that fundraiser at El Portal in 2023. Remember we had that door... Yes, uh, meet and greet, which which again, there's going to be a meet and greet with Ruben Gallego tomorrow at El Portal, which you'll talk Correct. a little bit about. So, um, and at that time, Ruben Gallego said to me, "The only chance we have to possibly beat Eli Crane is having a Native American as the candidate." And here we are with Jonathan Ness having a shot. What's your feeling about where? I know you're optimistic, but what's your feeling based on who you talk to and what the what the vibe is among the door members about about this race and all the other big races? The vibe is positive. I think the entire campaign and all the campaigns got a, an energy boost when Kamala became our nominee. Mm-hmm. And I think that boost, boost has continued. There have been continuous uh, phone calls or Zoom calls rather with thousands and thousands of people on them she's going to do she's just doing rallies across the country many times a day i mean she's getting decent coverage um there's a lot of excitement about her when we go knocking on doors as canvassers we are hearing positive things up and down the ballot um door has done a huge educational um effort to inform people on the about the propositions as you said earlier this is a four page ballot yeah. and so it's incumbent upon groups like door all around the the state to inform people about what those ballot propositions mean so we've had a session at Mary Fisher Theater a couple of weeks ago with a, a statewide expert um, on the propositions, and we're doing everything we can to educate them. You mentioned the DOOR website. We do have a ballot guide um, giving our recommendations and why on every single one of these propositions. And judges, don't forget about the judges. People are really stumped on those. Mm-hmm. On the DOOR website, we have the ballot guide that includes the judges, the propositions as well as the candidates. And it is in English and in Spanish. 
because there are so many people that spa are Spanish speakers that are having real problems figuring out what to do on their ballots. And we are urging people to go all the way up and down. But we are very optimistic. I watched Kamala last night at that rally in Houston with thousands of people, yeah. and she was she was fabulous. And um, when we knock on the doors, we hear nothing but good things and positive feedback. Last Sunday, I was out for hours and did not did not get anybody that was a Trumper. We got two undecideds that were leaning towards Harris. When when you um, so there are a number of Republicans on the ballot running unopposed. Yes. For some issues, what is what is Dora's take on whether or not do you just advise people not to vote for those candidates at all, even if they're unopposed? Pretty much, yeah. you know, they're they're don't going, vote they're for the Republican. Yeah, don't vote for I mean, Republican. they're they're pretty much going to win anyway. There's nobody right. else against them. There's you know, you can do a write-in, but that won't won't do anything. In an area this red, it is difficult to find candidates. Like, this, for example, the Clean Slate for Democracy and right. for LD1. They're running for the state legislature, but there's a 30% Republican advantage in those districts. So their chances of actually winning are very, very slim. But they're spending this entire year campaigning and giving up their life and their free time just to do that. So it is difficult to find candidates in districts like this. I'll say that the candidates, uh, Democratic candidates, have gotten better and better. I remember when we first started interviewing uh, Democratic candidates and when, when I was uh, doing a lot of the stuff for Door, um, what, gosh, there were some bad candidates. They were really wonderful human beings, right. but they were very inarticulate. Um, I remember doing an interview on Democratic Perspective, and one of the candidates could barely talk. You know, we, we kept having that's to ask good, that's not a good more trait and more for questions. A political candidate. Yeah, uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> so I would say that the, candidate, the quality of candidates has improved greatly. We started doing, Dick Searle and I started doing the propositions years ago. It was one of the most popular things that we did as door was sending out information on the proposition because they really did baffle things, uh, people. Um, I will say that the, the, the propositions this year, the only good thing you can say about them is except with one exception, um, they're not as dishonest in the way they're phrased as right. we, in past years. In past years, the, the propositions were the exact opposite of what they were supposed to be. Well, speaking of the propositions, let me interrupt you, sir. Sure. So as long as you brought that up, um, I've, I've been harping mainly on the proposition about abortion rights. So if you, either of you could pick one other of the 13, which is now down to 12 if we already assume that, you know, the abortion proposition is covered, what would you think would be the most important one if you could you could? Pick freedom something. all is my <laughs> is my take. I don't know about Ellen, uh, but we had um, last week we had um, um, the um, radio uh, Democrats of the Rim Country has their own radio show over in Payson now. Oh wow! Yeah. And uh, we had an interview about the propositions with uh, with their their guy who's on the air and. Uh, we disagreed about one proposition, and that, and that's 140. Uh, so I would think I would think 140 is something that people might want to take a look at. And just so you know, they're one, in favor one, of it. Yeah. One, 140 establishes seemingly beneficial open primaries, but risks giving the legislature too much power to interfere with the process. That's really weirdly worded, isn't it? It is weirdly worded. Yeah. Um, what can I say? The, uh, uh, there are so many different propositions that it's hard to go through them all. And, and so I do, ag I do completely agree with, with Dorr to, to, to oppose them. Uh, Democrats of the Rim Country is very much in favor of 140. And so there is an argument in favor of 140 as well as against it. Right. So that's something that people should look at individually and think about. Yeah. Um, it's a complex issue. Um, and, uh, Always when we, we used to endure, we used to come up with our recommendations for propositions back in the old days. Um, 
the county would always be a little bit different. Right. We'd be 99% or 90% similar, and we'd have one or two propositions that we'd disagree on. And that's continued. Right. So some Democrats are in favor of it, as well as, as, as uh, folks around here right. are against it. Ellen, how about you on the propositions? The ones that I think are the most problematic are 134 and 136, and they have to do with taking the power out of the hands of citizens and putting it in the hands of the legislature. They are making it much, much more difficult for citizens' initiatives to ever see the light of day. Right now, I mean, this past year, we have been gathering signatures on petitions for Prop 139, the abortion petition, um, and... We, I mean, we ended up getting 800 and some thousand signatures. It was a massive movement because it was a massively popular uh, proposition. However, there these two props um, make it much harder for citizens to get initiatives on the ballot. For example, this 134 would require that 10% of the uh, signatures, total signatures gathered, would have to come from every single county in the mm-hmm. state. Well, that makes it nearly impossible. And if you have one county that can't get those signatures or where someone is coming out and spending a lot of money against a citizen's initiative, that can kill the whole thing. The other uh, one that, that affects um citizens initiative is 136 which allows any person to sue to invalidate a citizens initiative before it is even placed on the ballot gee i wonder which party recommended that proposition to get on the ballot well you know all of these propositions have come out of the state legislature except um, very few including 139 these are things uh, that the state legislature passes these propositions so they can go directly at a referendum directly on the ballot, bypassing the governor's ability to veto this legislation. Mm-hmm. So this is a new trick that the legislature has has uh, found. That's why our ballot is four pages long, because they put everything they think that governor will veto goes on as, goes on as a referendum. Yeah. And it ends up on the ballot and bypasses the governor. One, one of the things, um, since we're talking about legislature, the legislature in Arizona, um, at this point, I think the Republicans have a one seat uh, lead in both houses. Is that is that my understand? Yeah, one seat lead in the leg in, in the okay. So, what are the chances of that flipping this year? I know Arizona right now, depending on what poll you look at. Some people still think Trump could win Arizona. I don't think that's going to happen. But what do you? What's your sense of whether or not the legislature could flip this year? I think that this is a very good opportunity for the Democrats to take control of the House or the state, or possibly both, or the Senate, yeah. Senate or right. or both. Um, there are some very very strong Democratic candidates, especially in the Phoenix area. Mm-hmm. And um, if we just get a few of those in, then I, th- I think we'll be able to capture the Senate. We've got um, lots of very strong Democratic candidates. Yeah. This is uh, the year. We've yeah. been stuck by losing by one, uh, seat, can- yeah. <laughs> one seat for years. We've been battling, and we always think we're going we're gonna to win. I think this year we can actually flip the legislature. I think this is our best chance in the 20 years I've been doing democratic politics. And um, I would think that given the last election when, when Arizona voted for a Democrat for governor, secretary of state, and attorney general, that the that wave is sign. going in that direction. That was a sign. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what's going to happen? Who knows? Right. But um, we've, we've had a long struggle to, to look. The craziness will stop if we have a Democratic majority in either the House or right, the Senate. Right. This, this nonsense, this craziness, these b- bizarre propositions, these Im- impenetrably stupid um, <sighs> referendum like a word. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't think of a better word. But that'll stop. Yeah. It's yeah. just one seat. 
and and that the craziness will stop. Yeah. I want to I want to uh, relate an anecdote to both of you and get your take on it because it really struck me this week. I was uh, I had to be in West Sedona, so I was driving up 89A. Um, it was the afternoon, and I'm I'm stopped at a light near. I'm I'm getting into the weeds in local Arizona and Sedona stuff right now. For all my podcast listeners, they're going to go, "Where is that?" No, anyway. So I was at Coffee Pot, where a lot of the demonstrations, whether left or right, happen up the main drag in West Sedona, which is 89A. So I'm stopped at a light, and I see four women looking about in their 40s, posting yard signs on the road that say, Kennedy Democrats for Trump make America healthy again. Um, I can't tell you like what my, my visceral reaction to that. Not only that these were people that were supposedly Democrats, but they were for Robert Kennedy. And not only that, they were saying that voting for Donald Trump is going to be good for health care. This is a guy that tried to kill the Affordable Care Act. You know, this is a guy who caused hundreds of thousands of people to die during the pandemic because of his incompetence. Stephen, you've lived here for a long time, and you've been political. Where are these people in Sedona coming from? There's a strong uh, community in Sedona um, oriented toward health, alternative health, and they're very much threatened by government regulation. So if I say shiny bright lights will cure cancer, then the FDA comes and says, no, you can't do that. Um, But they have to be anti-vaxxers if they're Kennedy Democrats, right? The truth is, is, is I, I, Stephen, I hate calling the new age community, but there's a strong community here of alternative medicine, and that's who these people are. Uh, years ago, I, I uh, my um, co-host and I um, did some interviews, and what we what we found was that there were a whole group of supposedly new age folks that I always thought would be voting with us. Right. That were that were voting. Uh, they even uh, they even adopted a lot of QAnon things. But aren't these people also uh, climate change? Um, we we were shocked. People? We were shocked to find out that QAnon was making roads inroads. In I guess yeah. that's the correct word. Inroads into the into this community in yeah. Sedona, and that's what you're seeing now. Yeah, it yeah. Ju- it just it just really struck and appalled me. I, I I you know it's one of those moments where you wanted to have road rage and open up your window and and just scream at them. So Ellen, as somebody who talks to a zillion people here during, uh, especially during an election campaign, you and people that are canvassing for door are talking to Republicans when they go up and knock on doors trying to get votes. What are you hearing from people like Republican, uh, like Democrat, Kennedy Democrats for Trump and, and, and anybody else who may be on the other side? Do you have any anecdotal info on whether some of those people have been able to be flipped? Some of them have. There's a big Republicans for Harris movement in Arizona. Oddly enough, it's centered in Prescott. Wow. There are a lot of Republicans that are just fed up with the constant chaos. Right. Why is it constantly, And I mean, every day there's some new outrage. And I think a lot of the Republicans that uh, that may flip are sick of the browbeating of the immigrants. When you watch, if you just watch a lot of television, that is all you will see. You won't see... What will he be doing for the country? What what new policies does he have? How will he help? It is only immigrants, immigrants, immigrants. And if people live in Sedona and this anywhere in this state, they know that there are so many immigrant families that are working hard every single day mm-hmm. to provide a better life for themselves and their children. Their kids are getting scholarships to go to college. They are... Uh, starting businesses of their own, they're paying taxes. These are people that are being attacked unnecessarily because Trump wants to use that as a campaign issue. And I think a lot of the Republicans 
are seeing through that. And I'll, t- I'll, I'll give you another, uh, like maybe if that's 1A, I'll give you 1B on the ads that they're posting and who they're attacking as boogeymen, trans people. A report came out recently that the Trump campaign has spent upwards of $65 million on placing ads in various states attacking the trans community, talking about how Kamala Harris uh, approves of sex change operations in, in school. You know, just, you know, it, it's, it's beyond vile at this point. And, you know, the, the sad reality uh, is that even when Kamala Harris wins the election, just like when Joe Biden won, when Joe Biden won in 2020, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. And what just kills me every day is the knowledge that even if Kamala wins, which she will, upwards of 65, 70 million people are going to vote for an insurrectionist. How, you know, you could go on and on talking about it. I mean, that said, let me ask you, like, how you both feel about where the campaign is. What you, Stephen, what's your gut telling you about what's going to happen on, on November 5th? I, I think Kamala Harris is going to win. And uh, I think she'll win more substantially than the polls are yeah. saying. Um, immigration, I don't know... When I look at trans stuff, Steve, I can't understand why they hate trans people. I understand they don't want to spend money on trans operations and so forth and so on, but they can't understand that immigration and immigrants is is another issue. And I'm afraid the there was a study recently in the the Time, and it said that um, the majority of people, I think it was in Pennsylvania or some of those eastern states, didn't believe Trump about eating pets or any of that right. stuff, but they were still against the immigrants. Right. There's a, a real turn in the United States uh, against immigration and immigrants. Um, it's going to be a long haul to sort of undo that. Yeah. Um, and I recently talked to somebody who is, is not a Trumpster. Um, but he said, uh, he said to me, he said, uh, um, they're, they're not, what? Immigration. He's, he's, he's blaming uh, Kamala Harris and the Biden administration for not stopping immigrants. And what he said was, when Trump was in, there were less immigrants. Immediately, Biden gets in. There's this flood of immigrants into the country. Uh, we have to deal with, as Democrats and progressives, with getting the message out of the benefits of, of immigration as well, well and also as the call, negatives. And also call out the lies and how they manipulate the statistics because, you know, Trump will get on a rally and he'll talk about millions and millions. It's almost like listening to the, to the bizarro world called Sagan talking about the billions and billions of immigrants who are coming into the country, complete lies, like he does all the time. I mean, the guy wakes up and he lies when he's brushing his teeth. So, you know, look, I've I've been harping on this for a number of years, and one of the things that has always driven me crazy is the people on the Democratic side, on the liberal side, sort of, railing at the universe and asking the question, why and how can so many people vote for a guy like Donald Trump for president? And the media never will go to the real root of the problem. They'll kind of talk about it in euphemisms. But my answer is this. Unfortunately, and this goes back to where I started the show with being disillusioned. There, is a, there are a huge number of people in this country who are on board with white supremacy, Christian nationalism, and are completely fine with there being an American oligarchy like there is in Russia. As, as exemplified by what Jeff Bezos just did with the Washington Post, what Elon Musk is doing in trying to help getting Trump elected and being in bed with Russians. It is clear as day. 
the the only reason to to excuse somebody like Donald Trump who talks about who who is openly fascist and who talks about admiring Hitler aside from the fact that it's been 80 years since World War II and people obviously don't study history anymore um it's it's white supremacy and Christian nationalism these are the two driving forces on the right and they will excuse anything and it's all engineered by these right-wing think tanks like the Heritage Foundation who are responsible for the Supreme Court justices that Trump was able to appoint, who are responsible for people like Eileen Cannon. Their goal is to turn this into a right-wing country where, you know, votes don't matter anymore. I mean, it's it's incredibly depressing, and I'm sorry to depress the both of you. No, I think you're being accurate, Stephen. I mean, it is worrisome. And win this election or lose it, it is worrisome that we have as many people, uh, particularly white Americans, who are threatened by what's happening to the country. They are threatened, and they are angry. And how we undo that, I don't know. You may have some ideas, but I, I, I just don't know. But we have to face the fact there are a lot of really negative ideas and and uh, a, a yeah. p- positions out there. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you said win or lose the election because just to pick up on that, even if Kamala Harris wins, we got we have to worry about what's going to happen four years from now because. I don't think it's any guarantee that the Republican Party in the next four years is going to suddenly become the party of Mitt Romney. I mean, th- this is what their agenda is. I mean, for all we know, Mike Flynn could be the nominee in 2028 or Tucker Carlson or Stephen Miller, God forbid. I mean, this is the direction that we're going, unfortunately. Ellen, what's on Doors' agenda going towards November 5th in the few minutes we have left? Tomorrow, we have... Congressman Ruben Gallego will be at El Portal, and we're hoping that we have a big turnout for him. Um, He's coming to thank the people of Sedona and the Verde Valley for uh, for their support Mm -hmm. this whole past year. We have ongoing canvases almost every day launching out of uh, the door office and out of uh, the village of Oak Creek, and we are expanding into... Uh, Cottonwood and Clarkdale, we will be doing canvassing, including uh, on November the 5th. We will be doing up up until the last minute. And now it's get out the vote canvassing. It is not persuasion. It is just please don't forget to vote. We need to turn our people out. And then we have a watch party uh, the the night of the 5th. Everybody, you heard it from Ellen. And, and if there happen to be any Republicans or independents listening to this show. I'm not betting there are many. Please go out and vote for Kamala Harris, for Ruben Gallego. Also, vote for the people on the Arizona Corporation Commission, which is a very important ballot. Real quick, I was very impressed. The Mother Jones magazine did a piece on the Arizona Corporation Commission, and Jane Fonda canvassed with them. Yes, she did. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. So... Well, that's it for today's Patriotic Progressive. I've been your host, Stephen Hanks, and I want to thank my spe- very special guest, Democrat, uh, Democratic candidate for Arizona CD2, Jonathan Nez, which was a great calling guest. Democrats of the Red Rock president, Ellen Ferreira, who has been on this show multiple times, thank you. And Stephen Williamson, host of the Democratic Perspective broadcast here on KAZM Mellow Mountain Radio on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. Steve, real quick, who's your guest tomorrow? Who is our guest? Uh, Nikki Check. Oh, Nikki Check. Nikki Check. Right. We're having Nikki on again. I th- think she's a great candidate. Great. And um, I could have added other people, but I thought we'll just do it with Nikki uh, cool. again. We did an hour with her before. Thank, and thanks to my sponsor this week, Aubrey Sondereger, the Democratic candidate for Coconino County Reporter. Aubrey has worked to defend voting rights and elect people into government that will uphold the ideals of democracy and civil rights for every citizen. If you want to continue the legacy of free and fair election services in Coconino County, you must vote for Aubrey Sondaranger for recorder. Many thanks to my producer in the booth today, Chuck Helstein. And remember, you can live stream our show on MellowMountainRadio.com and hear the podcast version on Apple and Amazon Podcasts. 
my YouTube channel, Spotify, and now my Substack newsletter at Patriotic Progressive. On next Saturday's show, I'll be a nervous wreck talking about the election, which will be just three days away. But for now, thanks for listening to the Patriotic Progressive for truth, justice, and the democratic way. Have a great week, everyone.